All right, thanks. This is a, uh, we have an additional uh, dimension to the lecture today. We're, we're webcasting it, so um, on behalf of Haystack Observatory and the Atmospheric Sciences Group, I want to welcome all of you in person and all of you out there on the webcast. Um, it's very nice to have you come in from not only locally but remotely. Um, I've had a number of people write to me expressing some gratitude that we were able to then send this lecture out to a wider audience as well. So, uh, again, welcome to Haystack and the 19th annual Michael J. Buonsanto Memorial Lecture. Uh, those of us who are Michael's friends and colleagues find it hard to believe that this is the 19th lecture, which is a bit of a testament to the legacy of his work and the enduring nature of his collaborations and the science that he did. Um, before I introduce our speaker right over here, um, I will just spend a moment or two uh, reminding the audience, both locally and remote, about Michael's work and his legacy. Um, these are two of our favorite pictures of Michael. One on the left uh, in his office, uh, smiling at, uh, you can see, it's a little bit grainy, but you can see him smiling at someone as he prepares to, to duke it out on the board, having to do with some probably ion velocity measurements, if I know Michael correctly. And then on the right is Michael in his trademark red sweater, which we were just commenting just before the lecture, was ubiquitous. It followed him wherever he went. And you could certainly spot Michael in a conference by looking for that red sweater. <laughs> um, Michael as a scientist was an extraordinary person, which is one of the reasons why we've been doing this for 19 years and will continue to do so. Um, as a scientist, he uh, had more than 70 refereed articles in his career, uh, 60 in the years between 1989 and 1999 in his very untimely demise, 13 as the sole author, and 25 as lead author with 50 plus collaborations. And those of us in the atmospheric sciences community, the upper atmospheric sciences community in particular, remember that Weichel was the most faithful person at the CEDAR meeting, which was our annual meeting, on running a workshop on ionospheric storms, and he would pile up dozens of collaborators in this way and would keep us all on track making progress happen on storm studies, a subject that is of intense interest to our group at Haystack and still continues today. So there's just some of the sessions that he led at the CEDAR meeting, the CEDAR storm study sessions, and then it's, uh, I don't expect you to read that, but this list goes on in terms of collaborators. Michael's uh, particular focus was the disturbances in the ionosphere and space weather, and I know that that's something that's going to be part of today's lecture. Uh, this is an EOS article he published in 1997 with Tim Fuller Rowell um, out in Colorado about strides made in understanding space weather and Earth. And this paper uh, on the bottom, the Ionospheric Storms, a review paper, is a real landmark. It was published in the year that he passed. And um, today, in fact, I was really surprised because I went back to this paper to see how many times it had been cited. In the last year, the citations went from 495 to 691 for a paper that is basically nearly 20 years old and one of the landmark things that Michael did. So just a reminder that his, his work continues to have a lasting impact. And in our field, that number of citations is extremely significant. He also worked a lot on ionospheric climatology, and that is something that our group continues to do. For example, this is work he did with John Holt and Shun Rong here at Haystack, having to do with modeling the local upper atmosphere based on our normal Millstone Hill incoherent scatter data here at mid-latitudes. And these models, later expanded to other uh, locations across the globe, have been really the foundations for a lot of space weather studies. So once again, Michael was an early pioneer of doing this kind of thing. And the community really appreciates these empirical data-based models. He was also an extensive person for education and student training. He spent more than 10 years as a mentor for our summer research experiences for undergraduates program. And his students got journal articles out of it, which if you go look at REU programs is somewhat unusual, even on the national level. And some of the, uh, so there's Larry Pullman, who was uh, from Minnesota. <coughs> This is Olivier Vitas, who in fact went on to be the planetary science, one of the planetary scientists in the ExoMars missions. And this is uh, E.K. Tung and Dwight Seipler, our colleague uh, who did optical work. All of these people were REU students. One of the hallmarks of um, Michael's work was an open collaborative atmosphere, and he really enjoyed working with students in it, and it shows. So he was certainly a scientist 
an outstanding one and an outstanding colleague and a mentor and a friend to many of us, including both Larissa and I. And so that's another reason why we're very pleased to host this lecture. So with that introduction to Michael, I'm going to introduce our speaker, a uh, little bit about her. Um, so our speaker this year is Larissa Goncharenko, who is a research scientist here at MIT Haystack in the Atmospheric Sciences Group. Um, she has a number of major areas of interest, including ionospheric thermospheric coupling and dynamics and electrodynamics of the ionosphere and thermosphere, particularly on processes through the whole atmosphere from the lower atmosphere and coupling to higher, higher altitudes, and that is going to be part of the subject of the lecture today. Um, Larissa worked in physics at Kharkiv uh, National Polytechnic Institute over in Ukraine and then she was at National Polytechnic University for a couple of years before coming over here at MIT, first as a visiting scientist in late 1994, and then she joined our uh, observatory uh, in 1997 after being a postdoc from 1996 to 97. And her office was bas basically right next to Michael's, so we had many, many very excellent discussions. Um, before she got to Haystack, uh, Larissa focused on essentially ionospheric heating, which is a parallel technique where you, you put high frequency waves into the upper atmosphere, heat it up, and then observe those dynamics to understand the physics and chemistry of what's going on. Um, here at MIT, she does experimental studies with a number of things, incoherent scatter radars, GPS TEC, ionosons, satellite data, and collaborates with people across the modeling spectrum. Um, she's the recipient of the Cedar Prize Lecture in 2012, a NASA Group Achievement Award in 2008, and an MIT Excellence Award for Education, in fact, in 2003. And she's the author or co-author of more than 70 refereed publications. So with that, the title of Larissa's talk, I'm going to put up here, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much for giving the lecture, and I'm looking forward to hearing it. Thank you, Phil. Um, thank you very much for coming and uh, for joining us online. Uh, I am uh, really pleased and humbled to deliver uh, a uh, memorial lecture today. Um, Mike was a dear friend and cherished colleague. You and uh, uh, <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll be a little louder. M Mike was a dear friend and a cherished colleague. Actually, was, his office was right next to me. And we shared a number of um, interesting and really enlightening discussions in uh, our several years together at the Haystack. What I wanted to... Uh, mm, show today and what I wanted to discuss today, actually a lot of work that uh, mm, our group and our community in general was doing, which is uh, mm, really sort of unexpected look at the legacy of Mike's research. How we taking similar approaches but applying them in a, a, in a different manner to, to different kinds of problems. And I will be talking today about uh, sudden stratospheric warmings and how they affect uh, entire, uh, entire atmosphere at different levels. And uh, one of the ideas what I will try to convey as we study ionosphere thermosphere system, how what happens at, uh, mm, uh, at, uh, in the, uh, how what happens with polar vortex in the stratosphere, how it affects ionosphere thermosphere system really far away, uh, far away from the polar vortex. Uh, I will start with uh, uh, a really well known and really, I would say maybe frightening <laughs> uh, uh, figure showing complexity of the system that we study. If we study mm, atmosphere, ionosphere, magnetosphere system, which is subject was strongly driven by all kinds of what we call inputs from above, solar radiation uh, 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 energy input from solar energetic particles energy input, driven by solar wind, magnetospheric energy input, everything what we call from above. And you see a number of different arrows showing different, different kinds of processes, how system uh, absorb this energy, redistrib redistributes this energy, and how it's really, really complex. Uh, Michael was actively engaged in a lot of this work and uh, was really, really productive in understanding how this happens. And one of the primary examples when, uh, we, uh, uh, when we have um, very strong driving from solar wind, from magnetosphere, is what happens during uh, geomagnetic storms, as Phil, uh, Phil already mentioned. 
And a strong geomagnetic storm is a like, primary example when we have major variation in drivers from solar wind, from magnetosphere. And uh, it helps us really to understand how entire system works when it's under strong driver conditions. Uh, and it, it enables us to understand, in general, how energy is transferred from sun all the way to the uh, near-Earth space. In addition to uh, these strong drivers, you see over here some yellow arrows that show, uh, and, uh, and so some arrows that show low atmospheric chain. Our community for a long time uh, understood that there is also some forcing, some energy that comes into the ionosphere atmosphere system from lower altitudes. And um, uh, for uh, decades, so people know it in general, and we would uh, like schematically uh, indicate that if we're, if we're interested in the ionosphere atmosphere system, and we understand that it is strongly driven by above, solar magnetospheric geomagnetic processes, very strong driver and uh, driven by coupling from below through different waves. We, uh, we call them gravity waves, tides, planetary waves, and difference between wa these waves are their different periods, from minutes and hours to uh, several days. So we, we understood all of this, and our traditional school of thought that uh, solar magnetospheric geomagnetic processes are really dominating driver. They dominate everything what happens in the thermosphere system, and a little bit comes from below to, uh, uh, to make this picture complete. And primary example of uh, this driving is a strong geomagnetic storm. So this was traditional school of thought, and this is really how uh, we had, as a community, we had major advances with, uh, with this approach. Uh, what happened not too long ago, literally a little bit over a decade ago, that our community realized that uh, we need to look, start looking at things a little bit differently. We uh, understand now that in addition to all the drivers from above, what we call meteorological drivers also strongly contribute to variations in the ionosphere thermosphere system. And these drivers come from uh, gravity waves, from tides, pl from planetary waves, different planetary waves and tides uh, interacting with, with each other and modulating, and a, a large number, a real variety of very complex processes contribute to variation uh, in, uh, and energy distribution in the thermosphere ionosphere system, and it comes from below. One of primary example of this, maybe a lot of people in our community know so-called non-migrating tides, when we have uh, clouds in the troposphere, and they are distributed uh, not longitudinally, universally, not, not evenly along different longitudes, but more at some longitudes than, than, than others. And this uh, distribution in, uh, in tropospheric clouds le leads to longitudinal differences in electron density. Non-migrating tide effects, really well known and really well studied in our community for the last 10, ten years. Um, so what we, uh, this was one of the, one of the first, uh, first important exams of research. And uh, what I would say really major change that happened in the community, in our understanding, <coughs> that uh, in addition to what we thought before, that uh, traditional school of thought, thought that the system is driven by in energy inputs from above, uh, this arrow becomes much more significant now, that a new school of thought is that low atmospheric drivers actually can be, can be very important and sometimes can be actually dominant. And primary example of uh, m such process is sudden stratospheric warming. So in this case, we're looking like at two different extremes on the distribution of uh, different types of events in the system. One extreme, very strong geomagnetic storm, and might contribute really a lot to understanding what happens under these drivers. And another extreme is like very different type of disturbance that comes all the way from the stratosphere, comes all, all the way from lower altitudes and contributes to variations. And uh, uh, these are two, two extremes on a continuum spectrum of uh, different variations. And real system is always superposition of some of that, some of this, and some of that. Um, so, uh, 
and uh, I uh, now I need to explain or talk a little bit more about what what it is sudden stratospheric warming. And for that, I need to start with what it what what is polar vortex. And um, usually, <coughs> when I talk about polar vortexes, I say, "Welcome to the dark side," <laughs> 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 because a polar vortex is uh, is the area of a low pressure zone in at high in high latitudes, either Arctic or Antarctic, where uh, solar heating is much lower than uh, in other parts of the uh, Earth's atmosphere, and. Um, Solar heat is much, 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 much lower. We have very cold zone, which is really quite close to the to the, to the pole, and strong jet stream uh, uh, forms around the zone, moves uh, uh, moves eastward, and this jet stream actually uh, prevents. Um, uh, uh, high latitudes from communicating to middle latitudes. So this, this cold area stays cold for a very long time. In general, polar vortex is there all the time, but it is much bigger and stronger in winter. So uh, this would be our stable polar vortex, would be almost round and really close to Arctic, uh, uh, to high latitudes. And so this is uh, under conditions of strong jet stream. And sometimes there are conditions of when jet stream is much weaker. And our um, and, uh, jet stream would be weaker, would, uh, would move, uh, move around, wind, wind is uh, uh, lower than for stronger jet conditions. And uh, our cold air uh, that was restricted before to Arctic actually can move to different areas, and we can have some uh, very interesting effects because of this. So, and it is always interplay be between these two conditions. Uh, and what is sudden stratospheric warming? Sudden stratospheric warming is a major disruption of this, uh, of this polar vortex. So if this is our average more or less stable situation, sudden stratospheric warming, when we have extreme case of this type of variation. Um, what uh, this figure shows, so I, I, I will continue with a little bit about some main features of sudden stratospheric warming. If we look at stratospheric temperature uh, right at the North Pole, and our black line here is 30 year mean, and on top of the red line is uh, temperature over North Pole at uh, 30 kilometers altitude during particular event, in uh, uh, from 2000 uh, from July to July 2008 to 2009 so what we see that literally in a uh, matter of several days in two to three days our temperature in the stratosphere goes from colder than average winter to hotter than average summer you can imagine enormous shock in the system enormous change in the system very large temperature increase it is accompanied by very large variations in the uh, zonal wind system, in the jet stream. When we go uh, from a uh, wind going being much stronger and eastward compared to average, to actually reversing direction and going the way how it goes typically in summertime. So we go on from conditions that are stronger than average winter to conditions that are stronger than average summer in a matter of several days. Uh, so you can imagine that this is really enormous change in the system. Uh, we can look, when we look at uh, North Pole from above, when we look at the stratosphere, we can describe these variations in terms of disturbed polar vortex. And if we can, uh, we can look at it, uh, so this blue area is a low pressure zone with cold temperatures, and this is more or less average behavior. When we have our so-called normal polar vortex, approximately around, approximately around <coughs> North Pole. What we have during sudden stratospheric warming, we have strong disturbance when this vortex either pushed to uh, off of the center, off of the North Pole, and that creates actually high latitude areas where uh, stratospheric temperature is much warmer than before. Or in, in this case, we call this uh, vortex displacement event. Or uh, vortex, polar vortex can be actually broken in pieces, and uh, either and we can, we can form either too too uh, too cold and too hot uh, cells that uh, 
uh, again rot rotate around <laughs> uh, around North Pole. So a very large disturbance. Uh, another important feature is that this disturbance lasts for a long time. It covers large geographic area, lasts for a long time, and occurs actually quite frequently, one to three times every winter. In fact, some studies show that only 4% of, of winters do not have this type of disturbances. So long, loss, long-lasting, really powerful uh, event that changes energy uh, distribution in the system. What recent research showed some very interesting features how that this, this type of disturbance is not only limited to uh, stratosphere, to these disturbances of polar vortex, but uh, these disturbances can actually propagate all the way down to the troposphere and uh, affect our weather on the ground. And uh, to begin with, when we have, uh, and, it, and it happens because of amplified, uh, strongly amplified planetary waves, and one of the reasons for these planetary waves to be amplified is um, all kinds of anomalies in the, in the troposphere or on the ground. This is one of the really fascinating examples came, uh, came from studies literally less than 10 years ago. When um, people revealed, studies revealed that increased snow in Siberia in October generates planetary waves that interact with polar vortex, uh, change, uh, change jet stream, and push it a little bit more uh, northward. It interacts with polar vortex. It happens for extended period of time. Polar vortex get disrupted, as I showed in the previous slide, gets warmer and pushes jet stream to lower latitudes. And what happens when jet stream moves to lower latitudes? All that cold Arctic air that was uh, uh, that people who lived maybe in Norway and Finland used to used to it. It comes all the way to middle latitudes where you and I live. <laughs> and uh, later, it takes time to descend. And uh, later on, we see colder winter in the either in Eastern Europe or in United States. And. Uh, I really encourage you, if in doubt, check your utility, utility bills. <laughs> <laughs> one of the, uh, let me remind you, one of the really strong and really famous events happened not too long ago, January 2004, when we had a North American cold wave, when, uh, and for comparison, I repeat figure with uh, different polar vortex. This is our more or less typical polar vortex before disturbance sort of round, sort of centered around North Pole. And this is our abnormal polar vortex. When we have uh, these different, uh, different cells, cold and warmer cells, and they are not as restricted to uh, only to high latitude, but they actually propagate down, to, down to, uh, to lower latitude. And in this case, you see it actually extends to uh, United States. Doesn't happen that often. What happens, uh, 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 what happens during, during this time that this uh, cold Arctic air uh, propagates to uh, mid-latitudes and it collides with uh, mm, uh, uh, cold air from Canada, collides with some warm air from Gulf of Mexico, we have blizzards. We have, uh, for this particular case, throughout the entire United States, we had record or near, or near record temperatures in many, many locations. Minus 37 Fahrenheit in Minnesota, minus 9 Fahrenheit in uh, uh, Massachusetts, below freezing temperatures even in Tampa, Florida. Doesn't happen that often. So for that particular, uh, particular event, on one, on one particular day, January 7th, we had 49 record lows in, uh, across the country. And, uh, of course, all this, it's not only temperature, it is accompanied by strong wind, heavy snowfall because of these blizzard conditions. Um, again, from, uh, from these records, almost two feet of snow in Massachusetts, five billion in damage. When people don't expect things like this, this is what happens.
when you are not prepared to deal with, uh, with this kind, it turns into emergency. It turns into a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of large, large losses, including losses of lives. And uh, this, is, uh, this one picture shows ice, for ice formation on the river in Philadelphia. It doesn't really happen that, that, uh, that often. Another frequent event, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> So happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I assume, I, I, let me just assume that this type of thing happens not only in my family, <laughs> but in other families as well. There are more important things for us. We're busy with our professional lives, with families. There are more important things for us than go and fix your snowblower. <laughs> and this is what happens. <laughs> and, and, and I'm absolutely serious. So this is my, this is my, uh, my mailbox is, uh, slide moved a little bit. So this is my wi white one, y you see from distance, right? So this is my mailbox. So it actually takes quite a bit of time to um, dig it out and you'll find where is my mailbox. <laughs> 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 but uh, yes, so this type of thing we can expect uh, dur during such events. And what is interesting that uh, it's, uh, it, it, it happens two to three weeks after sudden stratospheric warming. So there is a long delay in propagation of these disturbances from stratosphere and descending down to a uh, tropospheric level. Uh, very important and very, uh, mm, uh, uh, um, like very important thing to know about meteorological research that these type of things are really can be can be really well predicted. Uh, meteorological research right now at the level of one, uh, where they have <coughs> very nice and reliable uh, forecast of conditions eight to ten days ahead. So this type of uh, this type of disturbance in polar vortex can be predicted, and uh, this is what I do every winter. I look at uh, I watch conditions online at different different websites, at different different data sources, and this is one of the examples from University of Berlin uh, maps from uh, some uh, NASA sites which shows prediction what will happen in. Um, 10 days from now. And uh, this, this figure shows zoomed in. Uh, so blue line is observations for this particular year. And black line is uh, mm, uh, pr uh, forecast for several days in advance. And when we see this, we say, OK, big one is coming. We really need to turn on our instruments. We really want to collect more ionospheric data to understand how all this, how all this affects ionosphere thermosphere system. Um, why, uh, why all, the, all of this is actually possible in meteorology? Important uh, part that uh, low atmospheric scientists have continuous observations, uh, ground-based, satellite-based observations, starting since 1979. Pretty much almost at the beginning of uh, mm, space age, we managed to put satellites in orbit and continuously collect good quality data on a global scale. Uh, this data uh, were put together, uh, thoughtfully put together into global data assimilation models. And these models provide different atmospheric parameters on very nice grid in space and in time. And literally dozens of parameters. So people have all this data. Uh, I already mentioned that reliable forecast is re available eight to 10 days in advance. And when people, uh, uh, when people started incorpor incorporating stratospheric conditions in their models, in their forecast, they actually learned to predict tropospheric behavior much better. Our, our weather forecast is becoming much better because we start to include in what happens at this, uh, with polar walks, what happens at 30 kilometers altitude. We start to include in this into in, in the forecast. In fact, this is really quite new uh, type of research. And uh, even a decade ago, it was really quite controversial topic if stratospheric disturbances can propagate to the troposphere. And uh, I remember talking to uh, people who were at that point, like several years ago, they were graduate students studying at MIT and other, at other schools. Now they are uh, working in the le leading age, uh, actually incorporating all this new knowledge to provide us 
better reliable, uh, better and more, more reliable and more extended forecast. In addition to that, uh, people, people don't stop at this and w when we count for these conditions, we can think about two to three months in advance forecast. So wouldn't it be nice if, if, we, <laughs> if we have it? Then I would maybe uh, bring my lawnmower uh, <laughs> to, to repair in advance. Uh, Again, this is not limited. This is one of the examples how, how, how we use uh, current knowledge to, uh, mm, to turn our knowledge into some in very, very important uh, deliverables, very important data products that are really useful and necessary for the community. But um, using all this type of data, people uh, look into much longer forecasts. There are other variations and there are other anomalies in the uh, in meteor meteorology and the lower atmosphere when people look at variations on time scales of years or uh, 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 several months or year or 18 months they are having a lot of um, mm, progress with this when they start looking into what happens now and i can project and i can forecast that 18 months from now we'll have severe drought in the east in eastern africa so, um, but uh, uh, again, underlying uh, 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 like basis for this is uh, a lot of data, a lot of good quality, high resolution data that enables this type of studies. Uh, let me move to ionosphere thermosphere system <laughs> and say that um, we live in a different situation. And I wanted you to contrast what we have, what people have, people, researchers who study in low atmospheric field compared to people who uh, work in our field, who work with ionosphere and thermosphere. So um, our research community is much smaller, our resources are, resources are much smaller, and we have so much more space to study. <laughs> 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 we have, if they study 30 kilometers and below, we study everything above, all the way to thousands of kilometers above ground. <laughs> uh, we really have, uh, we do not have enough measurements. We do not have enough observations. Some of them are on local, some of them cover only particular perimeters. Many important perimeters are really not observed. We do not have a good way of measuring them. Uh, we have only pieces of data here and there. Uh, we are starting data simulation efforts with what we have, but it's really only making first steps only now. Uh, if a meteorology has really good and reliable uh, uh, forecast 10 days in advance, and they had it years and years ago, and they are moving f marching forward with several months prediction, or year and a half prediction, we cannot even do 24 hour right now. So th this, is, this is where we are. Uh, we are not only trying to understand links between different pieces. We are at the stage when we are actually missing major pieces because we, we still do not know it. And overall, I would say we are on average maybe 30 to 50 years behind meteorology. Well, th that, that's the reality. Uh, from another hand, so we can look at, uh, think of all this and put sad, sad face and complain about our lives. <laughs> Another way to look at this, uh, that there is so much opportunity in this field, so, so many opportunities, and so much room for a really innov innovative mind. Um, a lot of people work on enabling new types of observations, developing new instrumentation. In particular, in our <coughs> group, at Haystack, and in, in general, our community consists of half of them are engineers, half of them are sci scientists, physicists. Um, because we do not have, uh, we, because we are missing major pieces of puzzle, there is a lot of opportunity for really major discovery, for really discovering some ma major pieces. And one of the important things that if we, uh, we understand that how meteorology works and we understand their advances, if we make connections between low atmospheric physics and space physics, we can average this, uh, leverage these advances to really move forward with what we need, with a multi-day forecast of ionosphere-thermosphere system. Uh, 
uh, we had uh, we had a lot of progress and a lot of understanding, a lot of uh, major major steps forward in understanding what actually happens in the ionosphere during this type of events during sun stratospheric moment. Uh, just this year, we uh, published a paper at HUES, uh, mm, it was a feature article, when we tried to summarize what happens throughout the entire system, through, throughout the whole, uh, mm, uh, uh, whole atmosphere, wh what happens during sun and stratospheric warmings. And this figure summarizes uh, several, several things, several events, and you see it's how it is really, truly complex. So when we have our Polar stratospheric warming. We have uh, variations in Arctic oscillations. We have associated polar mesospheric cooling, lower lower thermospheric stratospheric warming. We have actually changes in ocean currents. We have changes in planetary waves, gravity waves, tides. We have changes in mesospheric uh, chemistry, uh, in circulations, all, circulation all the way in, in tropics. Uh, cooling in ozone in tropics, heating in the mesosphere, large variations in equatorial electrojet, solar, uh, solar quiet currents in equatorial ionization anomaly, and actually connections all the way across the globe to Antarctica, where we have uh, mm, variations in so-called polar mesospheric clouds. So this is truly global event that goes, con connects everything in the atmosphere from uh, the stratosphere from uh, North Pole all the way across the globe to all, all latitudes and all altitudes. Let me go a little bit um, uh, in more detail what happens actually in the ionosphere. One of the first results when we, <coughs> uh, that we obtained during such studies came to our really big surprise from low latitude ionosphere. When we realize that uh, during such events, we have very strong variations in, uh, in ionospheric vertical drift. And uh, this figure shows um, variations in vertical drift. Black line is uh, our average condition, and dashed lines is one sigma from average condition. Red lines are what happens during stratospheric warming. And you see major, major variations when, in this case, in, in the morning, in morning hours, our vertical drift is much higher than, um, uh, than average. And the picture is completely opposite in the afternoon hours when uh, vertical drift is much lower. Um, to people who work in the ionosphere and material system, this says really a lot. From what we know, uh, mm, from uh, all, from how we understand ionosphere and atmosphere system. Uh, we interpret this as evidence of enhanced semidiurnal tide. So we have peak uh, at one time and minimum six hours later. This is a uh, signature of semidiurnal, uh, six hours between maximum and minimum. And what, what is more important, that this uh, enhanced vertical drift strongly moves our plasma, our ionospheric plasma. So in case when we have uh, upward drift, our plasma goes upward, where mm, it moves to much higher altitudes, but at much higher altitudes, recombination processes are, work much slower, and we have buildup of plasma, increase in plasma density. And uh, when we, uh, S just several hours later, we have strong uh, uh, op opposite motion. When we have str uh, strong downward motion of the plasma, so it moves to altitudes where recombination goes much faster. And our uh, plasma plunges, plunges down to its inevitable death. We have strong decrease in electron density. And uh, so this is what we can expect from just from observations of vertical drift, and this is exactly what we see in our observation data with GPS total el electron content data. If uh, these are snapshots of uh, our average state at 15 UT, which would be uh, morning sector in, uh, in the uh, American, in American sector, so this is morning sector, uh, average conditions, and this is what happens during strat warming. So we have strong increase when plasma moves to, uh, um, plasma moves to, uh, peaks of equatorial ionization normally are strongly formed and move to higher latitudes. 
and large increase in total lectin content, and completely opposite picture just six hours later. This is average behavior in the afternoon, and you see strongly diminished uh, lectin density during this event. So, uh, and, and you see from this figure that its entire uh, daytime low to mid latitude ionosphere is affected. And, and magnitude variations is huge, 50 to 150 percent. It's enormous change in the system. Um, other things that we saw and what we, uh, we were puzzled about, uh, if we take a look again at uh, total electron content at, over at American sector, this is where we have really good data, look at our mean behavior as a function of local time and latitude, so this is our, uh, how, how it looks on average. What we notice <coughs> is that during stratospheric warming, when we have increase in the morning, and these peaks uh, strongly formed and moved to higher latitudes, decrease in the afternoon. But notice that in a matter of several days, picture really changes and moves to la later and later local time. Very interesting uh, signature that we, uh, first, we did not really know how to interpret, but it was observed again and again that we, this progressive shift to later local times. And uh, combination of this uh, leads to a really large variability in total lectin content. So if we uh, look uh, at changes in the ionosphere from one particular location, from one, one for, like how would uh, observer in this, a single location close to a uh, 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 geomagnetic equator see this. And uh, this is, these are observations from um, magnetic equator over Hikamaka. This is normally in vertical drift data and normally in uh, peak electron density. And by normally I mean that we take observations and subtract average conditions. So what we see that this type of disturbance uh, so any, uh, blue is negative disturbance when we see decrease, uh, red is positive disturbance, and we see uh, that this disturbance actually lasts for a very long time. We have it for over 40 days, continues, continues going on and on and on. You will also notice that it has several quasi-periodic uh, signatures, several pulses, uh, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive again, like several cycles. And uh, this is in vertical drift, and corresponding signature in uh, electron density is fully consistent with motion of this plasma, either up or down, and really very large changes in electron density. Uh, so this is this was one of the uh, one of the major and, uh, uh, mm, like very typical signatures that we, we see this this quasi periodic variations, and I will later uh, talk about a little bit why why we see it. Uh, some other, every year when we keep studying, I told you before that we have, uh, every winter we have stratospheric warming, every winter we have more and more data, we look at it in a different way, we, uh, our understanding is growing. Just from this last winter, when we looked and uh, were able to summarize data at somewhat different locations, and we noticed in, uh, some interesting features like general change in, even in general morphology of a uh, low latitude ionosphere. If we look in this case at 120 degrees longitude, so in the Asian sector, and look at uh, total electron content distribution as a function of time and uh, for one particular day and latitude, and we see that <coughs> our uh, equatorial ionization anomaly looks more or less like a Pac-Man moving right. This way, right? When you see uh, that it's more, more or less rounded in the morning sector, and uh, this looks more like, uh, like open mouth. So our Pac-Man moving to the, to the right with peak electron density between 8 to 10 UT, and crests are really well separated in the evening sector. What happens during stratospheric warming is uh, completely different, that our Pac-Man changes uh, direction 180 degrees and actually starts moving left. When we see mm, enhancement in electron density and separation of peaks more in the morning hours, and entire density, entire signature moves several hours to earlier morning hours, and our evening is more rounded and uh, 
peaks are not as well separated. So it's very, very different signature, and even like in basic, absolutely basic uh, mm, uh, phenomenology of behavior. What is interesting is that uh, it doesn't happen, it's not limited only to low latitude ionosphere. This figure from our colleagues in Brazil shows major disturbances in the ionosphere in the American sector at close to 54 degrees south. So mid latitude southern hemisphere. So you can imagine a disturbance that starts at the North Pole in the stratosphere and strongly disturbs ionosphere all the way at, uh, in the mid latitude southern hemisphere. When we see already familiar variation that uh, white line is our dates of southern stratospheric warming, increase in temperature, and several days later we see strong increase in the morning sector and moves with several, uh, like within matter of days, it moves to later, uh, later hours. So major, major disturbances. Uh, main challenge actually to understand all these big pieces and to put them together, understand how they are connected and how this actually can happen. Uh, what we saw changes in the low latitude ionosphere, what we see ionospheric changes, we can describe them as tidal changes. And we can understand from our changes in vertical drift to changes in electron density, we know that connection. So that works, we, we, we understand that piece. What we don't understand is why, why are tides so disturbed? What makes them so disturbed? In particular, mm, sudden stratospheric warmings are related to uh, enormous, uh, 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 anomalous amplification of planetary waves. Those that are created because of uh, some anomalies in uh, land sea temperatures or anomalies in snow cover over Siberia, all those things, uh, all those disturbances create anomalous planetary waves. They grow uh, in amplitude to stratosphere, they interact with polar vortex. But the problem is that these planetary waves are actually created at mid-latitude. They do not propagate to the equator, and they do not propagate to higher altitudes. They uh, uh, break up and they diminish somewhere in the mesosphere below maybe 70, 80 kilometers. So what happens? So we, uh, we have some type of effect happening at mid-latitude, at low altitudes, but we see response all the way over equator at several hundred kilometers. So we, ne we need to explain how this normally carried both in horizontal direction and <coughs> also in vertical, because uh, this simply cannot happen. All theoreticians were truly puzzled. All journal editors kept sending papers back and saying, things like this simply cannot be published. <laughs> it, it cannot happen. According to all the theory, things like this do not happen. Um, in fact, if you look deeper into theory, and if you look, uh, if you start looking, looking not only at modeling, but at deeply theoretical work, you understand uh, connections from somewhat different perspective. And one of these perspectives is that when we have um, anomalous amplifications in planetary waves, and they break up somewhere in the mesosphere, and they actually set up a different global circulation. And this global circulation creates a mm, clockwise cell in the stratosphere and anti-clockwise cell in, at higher altitudes in the mesosphere. So this clockwise cell actually co causes adiabatic, coin, adi adi adiabatic warming in a uh, high latitude stratosphere, and this is our stratospheric warming. But anti-clockwise cell causes uh, cooling just above that in the mesosphere at high, uh, at high latitudes. And completely opposite picture over tropics. So we have cooling over in the stratosphere and tropics, but warming in the mesosphere over, over tropics. And uh, just if we, stop, uh, if we start thinking about this um, change in global circulation, and if, if that happens, what kind of changes uh, can happen in uh, with different wave transmission. We talked before about that energy is um, low atmosphere connected to upper atmosphere through different types of waves. Gravity waves, tides, tides and planetary waves. And what happens is that this circulation can actually disrupt this uh, propagation paths of these waves. So we can have altered tide generation, tide transmission, induced meridional circulation, altered planetary wave propagations, and altered gra uh, gravity wave propagation. 
And all of these effects coexist at the same time. Uh, so far, what I was talking about is really tidal effects and uh, close to low latitudes. And, what we, and we, we discussed what exactly tides are responsible. 12-hour solar migrating, 12-hour solar non-migrating, 8-hour tides, and so on. Uh, I have to uh, speed up a little bit, and I will say that after a lot of discussions, lots of debates, and lots of uh, people immediately put forward several mechanisms, and with uh, help of simulations, we mm, uh, realized uh, that it actually not, not what we thought before. And theories that were prevailing just six years ago were actually not correct. And most important mechanism uh, for amplification of tides is a change in propagation conditions. So remember that uh, those wind patterns when I was saying that it, it goes from uh, stronger wind stronger than average winter to uh, weaker than average summer. So it, and it goes through all the way through middle atmosphere. It, it changes propagation conditions of all different ways and changes in the way that they get strongly amplified. Okay, so this is good piece. We uh, understand this uh, and we understand that all tides get amplified. Uh, 12 hour, 24 hour, solar, lunar tides all get amplified, but some are get amplified better than others. And understanding complex interplay of these tides and wh what happens when and why is really quite a significant challenge. So this was from simulations. Do we see anything like this in observations? Do we see anything like this in real data? In fact, we do. And this is example from our Indian colleagues. Uh, and this is zonal wind uh, in India, 90 kilometers altitude. Uh, where people um, have really good high resolution data and they can separate and see that during stratospheric warming we have strong amplification in 24 hour tide, uh, diurnal tide, strong amplification in solar tide, red here, and amplification in lunar tide, blue here. Uh, let me point out that this data from India, one particular instrument will look at one, one partic particular location on the ground. Similar observations reported from China, Germany, Brazil, and unfortunately, we do not even have this type of observations. We do not have data. We do not have instruments that can collect this type of data. And because all of these things happen simultaneously, you have superposition of them, you need high quality, continuous data sets, and we do not have them. Uh, one interesting aspect that they, they are amplified, they have different phases. You have superposition of them. You are supposed to have a mess. You are supposed to have very complex, very variable situation. Why do we see consistent patterns of propagating and uh, remember that shift to later local times? Why do we have it? We are not supposed to have it. Again, it's something that uh, you know, goes against of all our understanding. Another big surprise, lunar tide is important. Who would have thought that? <laughs> lunar tide in general is very, very small. Don't, uh, 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 lunar tide that I'm talking about is not lunar tide that you see when you go on Cape Cod on vacation. Uh, it's, it's not that type of tide. Is this actually a gravitational pull on the um, atmosphere that uh, gra uh, moon's gravity works? And in general, it's really, really small. What about 10% of solar tide? Should not matter at all. Uh, it turns out it does. It gets amplified to level comparables to solar tide. And what is really important, uh, so we have both amplified, solar tide and lunar tide, but they have different phases. They interact, and the interaction can be destructive or constructive. And when we have constructive interference, we have very strong amplification. And uh, so this is a mm, theoretical work that shows, illustrates this concept. If this is our lunar tide and solar tide, for simplicity, same, ampl uh, same amplitudes. And this is uh, interaction of this uh, creates, <coughs> creates this uh, mm, quasi-periodic variations that propagate to uh, later, l later hours is with, within several days. Okay, I will, uh, I really need to move on. Other big pieces, other big surprise, thermal structure of the thermosphere changes, changes significantly. 
We have semi-Danian tides in the thermosphere, but they are dominated by cooling. So we have both warm and cooling, but cooling is much stronger. We have this from simulations, and I am trying to show you different pieces, like simulations and also data, real observations. We have this uh, simulations predict that we have uh, significant cooling of the thermosphere, but also our data on a uh, satellite drag. Uh, Multi-multi-year, multi-decades uh, research on changes in satellite drag actually found significant decrease in global temperature uh, of the order of five Kelvin decrease in temperature. That raises a lot of questions actually about how stratospheric warming occurrence contributes to long-term change and to, glo and to global cooling. Marching on, yet another piece. When we look at ionosphere over Antarctica, we still see changes, and they are still enormous, and we see disturbances of the order of factor of two. If this is what we saw over Antarctica before strat warming, this is what happens during strat warming, or uh, during one particular time, and this is uh, dur during another time. You see entire continent uh, electron density changes, and changes a lot by a factor of two. So you can imagine that something that starts with uh, more snow over Siberia in October gets amplified, disturbs our polar vortex at some, at some point in January. Uh, it gets communicated, disturbs everything uh, on its path all the way to in the lo in at lower latitudes in the ionosphere at several hundred kilometers, at middle latitudes, and goes all the way to Antarctica. So I, I, I think it is truly fascinating thing. Uh, Immediate question would be, okay, if we have such strong disturbances over Antarctica, what happens right above disturbed polar vortex? When we actually have strongest variations in, uh, in stratosphere, what happens in, uh, uh, in high latitude ionosphere above uh, polar vortex? And answer uh, to this question that we really don't know. We, we do not have this, this type of observations yet, we do, we do not have these studies yet. And, um, but what we think is that in, in this case, we have major disruption in gravity wave propagation patterns. And we have uh, simulations show that uh, gravity wave drag increases by the order of magnitude. But not just that, it is also strongly uh, Longitudinal dependent. There are patches of high activity and low activity. If this is what we saw, what we had before strat warming, and this is what we have during strat warming, really large disturbances, but depending on location. And uh, <laughs> another another example when we look at uh, how we can understand this, we can look at how polar vortex changes with altitude. And recent research shows that. Mm, if we look at average polar vortex variation with altitude, and this, uh, this work extended it all the way to almost 80 kilometers, we see that uh, compared to what happens in the stratosphere, at higher altitudes, polar vortex becomes stronger, but also covers much larger latitude. So it covers or goes all the way to mid latitude, goes all the way to maybe covers radius of close to 50, sometimes even up to 40 degrees in latitude. It's that strong. And when it gets disturbed, uh, all gravity waves that propagate, that used to propagate to high altitudes, become disrupted and cannot propagate anymore. Uh, so this is, this is just a concept of it. Is there any observation, any evidence? In fact, there is. And our young colleague, uh, Nathaniel Frisel, who is now at New Jersey Institute of Technology, worked really hard and uh, put together a really remarkable work that showed that medium scale traveling ionospheric disturbances, so it's uh, smaller scale variations of the order of maybe hour, um, hour to hour and a half, they have strong correlation with polar vortex dynamics and actually mm, they get suppressed after periods of weakening of polar vortex when we have the jet disrupted. And uh, for years and years, we thought about connection between TIDs and overall activity. What this study shows that there is no correlation with space, space weather activity, but there is correlation with polar vortex activity. Uh, I will uh, 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 just continue, continue to say that we're working hard on these different pieces. 
uh, another piece of research, again, major piece of research, tries to show that we have, in addition to strong daytime effects, we have very strong nighttime effects. When we have hole in the ionosphere, when density decreases by a factor of two to four, and extends all the way from mid-latitude in the southern hemisphere to mid-latitude in the northern hemisphere, and we think that that would change also propagation paths and dissipation of different uh, TIDs, of different gravity waves. And we think it could affect scintillations, but this is uh, still uh, work to be, uh, to be understood. Um, let me summarize some main results. Uh, what I try to show you, really, like big pieces. And a uh, variety of, of these pieces and a variety of effects is truly mind-boggling. If you are confused, uh, you're, not, you're not the only one. Most, most people are confused. <laughs> right now, we're at the point when we really just discover these major, major pieces. And uh, what we understand that variety of effects covers, uh, goes all the way, uh, so thi this, this anomalous cover go all the way down to the troposphere and all the way down to ocean currents and all the way up to several hundred kilometers. Many effects are not understood and atmosphere is coupled in uh, many more complex and more intri intricate ways than we thought even 10 years ago. What I find really fascinating that this anomalous, either in snowfall in Siberia or, uh, I did not talk about this, but temperature over Tibetan mountains, can turn into uh, large planetary waves and several months later can lead to uh, all, all kinds of interesting effects, that, uh, with including cold winters over the United States and major disturbances in electron density. One of the points that I wanted to make that uh, I was talking about how stratomen is this really uh, like enormous effect, like outlier on the continuum of all kinds of disturbances, really major, major, like extreme disturbance. In this case, it serves real studies of stratomen, serves icebreaker. When we send icebreaker to Arctic, importance is not just to, to send it <coughs> and break the ice. Real importance is what follows it. It enables, when we send, uh, send icebreaker to Arctic, it enables passages of some important things, or in delivering some important goods. In the, this is what I see stratomic studies as an icebreaker that really enables new approaches, new understanding of the entire IT system. Uh, what are implications for, uh, in general for ionospheric research? This study shows that we cannot think about system as we used to 10 years ago. We really need to consider meteorological forcing in understanding our IT system. And these impacts will maybe increase in the future with mild current, mild future solar cycles and dec large decrease in geomagnetic activity. We'll have more and more this type of disturbances in the IT system that come all the way from below. And connecting, uh, what we have, connecting knowledge, what we have from meteorology, from low atmospheric science, with our needs in uh, space weather, provides us direct pathway to building much desired multi-day ionospheric forecast. Uh, my vision in this case, shared with uh, a lot of colleagues in our community, uh, that again, we, when we look at geomagnetic storms and we look at stratomics, there are two extremes uh, two extreme type of disturbances. Uh, and we understand a lot by studying, using our, our minds to, to study, to probe each one of them. But during geomagnetically quiet time, uh, forcing from low atmosphere is dominant and uh, causes major disturbances in the IT system. What is important that geomagnetically quiet conditions actually dominate. It's not storms that happen more frequently, geomagnetic quiet conditions. And then low atmosphere would strongly dry what happens uh, really much more frequently. So my prediction is, and my vision that uh, in many years from now, we'll look at the f forecast on the ground to predict what happens in space. And we are uh, actively, act actively working on this. We're having really major progress. <coughs> And in this way, we continue Mike's legacy in truly unexpected ways. And I have extra slides for those who are interested. <laughs> you can vote if you'd like to keep going. Uh, 
So thanks, Larissa, for a really excellent and comprehensive lecture. And I, I think you can tell some of the excitement with which we're all, uh, Larissa especially, is pursuing this research. And to Michael's family, who have been here very faithfully every year for this lecture, again, I want to put this in context and understand that the, the spirit of discovery that Michael had looking at the upper atmosphere is some of the foundations on which a lot of this research is starting, but these things continue to flower in ways that we would have never predicted even 10 years ago. So in that way, Michael's work continues apace, and honestly, as I showed you with this, this citations, is accelerating. So um, Larissa, uh, we have one thing for you. Um, we wanted to recognize, see if I can find this here. We wanted to recognize um, your outstanding lecture here, and because I'm not as young as I once was. Um, we have this uh, plaque, which we'd like to present to you, which essentially, I'll read it, says, the Michael Bonsano Memorial Lecture Series, presented in grateful recognition of 19th annual lecture given by Larissa Goncharenko, research scientist at MIT Haystack. So on behalf of Haystack, thanks again for an excellent lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions, if there are some. Um, go right out. Uh, I will repeat the question after you give it. All right, so you mentioned Michael's uh, starting with those empirical models that we've used so many times. And said, any plans in the near future to add, he, he did it with geophysical drivers, any plans to try to repeat those empirical models, adding some of the meteorological drivers? So you want to summarize the question? Uh, yeah, so the question was, um, as Mike started uh, empirical modeling using available data many years ago, uh, are there any plans to continue this work and add other types of drivers? And uh, my answer, yes, we would love to do this. <laughs> uh, we, uh, uh, we have, um, we, we made major steps in understanding this, and we are investigating, but uh, a lot of it um, requires some additional funding. Let's see, we need to convince NASA. <laughs> but uh, I think we are doing a pretty good job with that, and we, uh, we made, as I tried to illustrate, we made some important steps on the way, and this is really something that I would like to pursue in the future to include uh, di different drivers and investigate how different drivers contribute to a, 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 a stereo thermostereo system. Yes, we certainly have these plans. Go ahead. Yeah, um, my question has to do with uh, stratospheric warming and uh, coupling with the lower atmosphere, which happens to be my particular interest. And, um, my, I guess my question is this, you talked about the polar vortex and showed us pictures of the polar vortex breaking down in the winter into the Rossby waves that are characteristic of the lower atmosphere and, uh, and probably the upper atmosphere too, for that matter. But uh, my, my question then is, th th does the stratospheric warming come first and have some aspect of driving that or is it possible that the Rossby waves associated with the polar vortex are what in fact create the stratospheric warming? Uh, both. And the answer to the question is both. So first we have uh, mm, Rossby waves, I call them planetary waves, that get amplified at middle latitudes. And yes, they, uh, this uh, enormous amplification of these planetary waves is a necessary condition for uh, mm, stratospheric warming, for disturbance of uh, polar vortex, and those created first in the troposphere. And uh, I gave as an example snow in over Siberia, but uh, there are several other uh, reasons why they could be created. And uh, as a matter of fact, it is still a matter of active research, and people still do not know uh, where exactly, why, why exactly pl planetary waves get amplified. People are, people are actively publishing, actively arguing about this. Some time ago, um, prevailing school of thought that it was these planetary waves interacting with polar vortex and they get amplified in the troposphere. Now some research shows that it's not only what happens in the troposphere, but what happened before in the state, previous state of the stratosphere is equally important and how these different uh, uh, layers interact with each other. And, and sometimes it can be, again, 
constructive superpositional effects when they get amplified. Or sometimes there are very strong uh, planetary waves and nothing happens. There is no stratospheric warming. So this is still active area of research. But and after stratospheric warming created and after this polar vortex got broken in pieces or shifted, again, disturbances can propagate to the troposphere, but not always. Some of them do, some of them don't, and dissipate somewhere um, in the lower stratosphere. And people also working hard on trying to understand what's the difference, what drives it, why in some cases it goes all the way down and makes me shovel several feet of snow, or in other cases it doesn't. Hey, Larissa, um, what do you think about you know the fact that we've had kind of a very weak period of solar activity? I mean, the last solar cycle is kind of a dud from those point of view of those of us who like activity. And, and you're observing, you've been observing these stratospheric formings you know, throughout this period and seeing strong effects on the upper atmosphere and on the space weather environment. But you know, how much of that is that we are really having a period of low driving activity at some level in terms of geomagnetic storms and stuff? Uh, well, uh, you're bringing up a very interesting question. Uh, if there is any connection with solar flux, between, between this type of events and solar flux, and in fact, some earlier studies showed positive correlation between level of solar flux and uh, stratospheric moment activity. So we, we are supposed, to, so some studies show, showed earlier that we have uh, stronger moments or more frequent moments during period, periods of uh, high solar flux. Other uh, studies connected uh, this to uh, mm, QBO activity, quasi-biennial oscillation activity. Uh, at the same time, there are extended periods of time when we did not have any stratomins at all. Like in mid-90s to early 2000s, we did not have anything. And last decade, we actually have uh, enormously high activity of stratospheric moments. And uh, the answer is that we, re we truly really don't know. What, what we have, even if they happen every winter, we still have record of maybe a little less, uh, little over 50 years. And we have so many different variables contributing to it to, that to sort out any activity uh, or any particular, what drives it, it's still, it's still work in progress. And statistically, it is still not that significant. Other questions? Okay, uh, Alan and then Shimon. I was going to ask, you, you mentioned that we don't have vertical velocity, uh, wind velocity data from the U.S. I think that's what you were saying, um, at least not com compared with what we have in India. What, what is lacking there? What, what instruments are needed to get uh, better, better data from the uh, vertical, particularly the vertical velocity, which I assume is the most important? Well, in this case, it's horizontal velocity, it's a zonal wind, uh, but a zonal meridional, so we uh, look at changes in tides in both zonal and meridional wind components. What is lacking? Uh, I think it's just will of our funding agencies. Uh, 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 yes, yes, observations. In terms of yes, uh, in terms of techniques, these observations are made by meteor wind radar. And, uh, India and China and Brazil invested in some new instruments and they built some instruments we were able to connect, connect, collect this data and separate. Again, that we need good quality data to be able to separate these things because there are so many, uh, superposition of so many different types. We do not really have it. We had some time ago meteor wind data, uh, radar data and, and meteor wind radars, uh, not a lot, only in several locations. In fact, we had one at University of New Hampshire and Durham ran by our colleague Ron Clark. Ron retired, there is no radar. Uh, I know people, for example, the University of Colorado worked really hard on new systems and new technologies. Um, we do not really have instruments. I think all of it is really only political will and to desire to build instruments to uh, collect this type of data. I should point out that we are at Haystack. We have some ideas on how to do this sort of thing. So uh, <laughs> we've noticed the gap. We perhaps are trying to fill it observation. Sean Rong, you had a question. Yes, uh, excellent, uh, Nectar. Thank you. And uh, so it's now uh, well known 
that uh, stress and warming effect uh, can produce significant uh, ionosphere disturbances, particularly at the low and uh, equatorial latitudes. And these are the type of stratospheric warming happening at the northern hemisphere. And uh, I was wondering whether there is any strong evidence showing the southern hemisphere uh, stratospheric warming effect. Uh, not yet. And uh, the uh, part of the question is that uh, this is truly uh, more of a northern hemisphere phenomena that happens with polar vortex over Arctic. It doesn't happen that frequently uh, with polar vortex over Antarctica because there is different uh, uh, land sea mass distribution and different types of planetary wave get excited in the southern hemisphere, and it simply doesn't ha happen that frequently. However, there was a really major event in 2002 that uh, caused a lot of excitement in low atmospheric community. People looked at it, but uh, mm, a lot of our studies that we do, uh, we, we use total electric content data, or other distributed instruments, like networks of distributed in instruments. A lot of things were done with magnetometers. And back in 2002, we simply did not have that much. In particular, we think that maybe it did not go, did not cross the equator, did not, wasn't observed in the northern hemisphere, but maybe some things were observed in the southern hemisphere. And we really do not have enough coverage, in particular in those years. Because we would need data over South America or over Africa or over Australia to pull anything out. At the same time, uh, there is information that disturbances were reported uh, in the mesosphere, and tidal type of disturbances. So I think effects do exist. It's really a matter of somebody um, looking, sifting through data and actually looking careful and trying to find it. We have not done that yet. Other questions? Thanks, and thank you so much for the well-explained uh, presentation. So my question is a clarification, more or less, about the point one you have there, that the geomagnetic and the solid atmosphere for me is, are you saying they are of the same magnitude? Uh, that point? Uh, uh, I cannot say that they are the same magnitude. If really strong geomagnetic storm comes, it wrecks havoc in the ionosphere thermosphere system, and we have major variations in everything, in winds, in dynamics, in, uh, in temperatures, in electron density. Uh, but uh, at the same time, when real strong stratospheric warming comes, it also creates major disturbances. What I have seen so far that if uh, they coincide, geomagnetic storm and strat warming, uh, and if geomagnetic storm is moderate, like of the order of maybe Kp5 to 6 minus, Stratospheric warming is stronger, and effects of stratospheric warming <coughs> prevail. But uh, mm, for stronger, for geomagnetic storm stronger than that, I think geomagnetic storm effects will be uh, will be prevailing, will be dominant. And this is another interesting question. So when we have again superposition of these drivers, do they cancel each other, or uh, they create even like even another variety of ionospheric and thermospheric disturbances. But it, it will, it's not that easy to sort out. But in, in experimental data, I saw that up to Kp6 minus um, stratospheric warming signature is still seen quite well. Other questions? If not, let's thank our speaker again for an excellent <laughs> So on behalf of Haystack Observatory and our Haystack friends old and new, near and far through the web, thanks again for attending the Buonsano Lecture. The lecture will be available online um, in a edited form shortly afterward. So I'd like to thank uh, everybody in the front office at Haystack for helping to make this possible, to our AV crew in the back who are very faithfully recording this, and to all of you for coming. So thanks once again for coming, and we hope to see you again next year. Thanks. Thank you.